right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the Duke Lemur Center and welcome to our evening with the experts series. Uh, this is Bevan Clark, who is one of our fantastic, uh, not only lead technicians here at the Lemur Center, but she's been here for more than 10 and a half years. Just came back from Madagascar doing some similar things, which she may discuss in here as well. And our resident mouse lemur expert. So this should be a fantastic talk. So welcome me and welcoming her. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'd like to impart some of my you know, joy and love of mouse lemurs, and hopefully some of you will take that with you. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, a little bit about the gray mouse lemur, which is Microsepus murinus. They are one of the smallest uh, nocturnal lemurs. There is a smaller uh, mouse lemur uh, called the pygmy mouse lemur, which is only 30 to 60 grams, so it's super tiny. But our guys tend to range between 60 and 90 grams, which is all weight. Um, during the winter time, and we'll discuss this later on in the husbandry, they get a little bit chubbier, so we <laughs> tend to see them going over 100 grams, um, but that's acceptable. Um, <clears throat> Our guys are pretty long lived in captivity. You might typically see half of that in the wild. Um, and they are listed as a least concerned uh, species by the IUCN um, because they are they can live in pretty degraded habitats. Um, and some of their other lemur cousins are a little bit more threatened than they are. But as <coughs> habitat is lost and um, there's no more forest for them, they will probably be more endangered later on. And here's their range, they're mostly in western Madagascar. So they're a very adaptable species, like I said, they can be found in really degraded forests. Um, they and the bamboo lemur are animals that are really, they are kind of the last lemur species in these really uh, disrupted forests. They can hang in there until um, everything's gone. Um, they're very uh, seasonally reproductive. Um, we're coming up on their breeding season. It's usually for us in North Carolina. The breeding season starts around April, goes through May. Um, that's usually the first cycle. And at about 59 to 62 days is their gestation period. And they typically, twins and triplets are common. We do see singletons every once in a while, but more than triplets, that's a lot of investment for the mom, and they usually aren't that viable. So they kind of max out at triplets. Um, they also, as I said before, they change weights seasonally as well. Um, and we see throughout the year, you know, during the summertime, they're active, they're getting ready to breed, or they are having infants. That's when they're slim and trim, ready to get out there, be go-getters. But then in, you know, the fall, mid-fall, they tend to slow down, become lethargic. They put on or store a lot of weight in their thighs and their tails. Um, not as much as our fat tailed work. <laughs> um, but it is, you know, it, you do see a difference. Um, and they go into a semi torpor state, um, not, not like our fat tailed dwarf lemurs. Um, and they can they become really lethargic. Their body temperatures come down to ambient temperature, but they do rouse themselves and get up to eat during the day. And their body temperatures can fluctuate between 10 to 20 degrees during the day, which is pretty amazing. So let's talk about our guys here. Um, our original colonies was brought here, um, our original founders were brought here in the late 60s, mid 60s. Um, and over time, we've had uh, 280 individuals living here. Um, we did have a really successful um, breeding population in the 70s or and so, but then in the late 80s, early 90s, our Colony got older, we shipped animals out to other facilities, and we just just stopped breeding. So in 2007, our director at the time and our curator, Andrew Katz, reached out to Martin Perre in Bruno, France, who has a lab there uh, full of mouse lemurs, and to see if they could help us get our colony going again. And so it was suggested that you know, instead of emailing and calling and the, that language barrier over the phone, let's send somebody over there to take a look. And I was fortunate enough to be chosen to go. So for a week, I went um, to Puma. So this is just a chart of all of the mouse lemurs that have ever lived here. So we had really good, well, actually in the early 80s, we had really good numbers of close to 80 individuals. And so here we have a dead zone. 
and we're getting back up there with 54 individuals on site. So, off to France. <laughs> this is what they all look like. They all have they speak French. <laughs> yes, they all had baguettes. Some of them were less patriotic than others and had wine instead of a fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this is a picturesque city or village of Brunois. Um, it's a very small village um, just outside of Paris. It's only a 20 or 30 minute train ride. And this is where the, all the mouse lamers are. It's this huge, beautiful chateau. Um, and so they have all their offices and things in here, and they have their vet labs. And there are other people studying other tropical, um, doing other tropical research there, not just on mouse lamers. Um, but mouse lamers were the main focus uh, for the director there, Martine. So some interesting history. It was used to um, hide Jewish students during World War II. Um, the original animals came in in the late 60s. There were only 10 founders, so all the animals that they have now are from those 10 founders. They haven't been able to bring any more in. So this is the staff enjoying table tennis in between looking at mouse singers. So just for kind of a, oh my gosh, at the time, they only had two full-time technicians to take care of over 400 mouse singers. Mm -hmm. So here we have 13 technicians for 234 animals. So it's quite, quite amazing that they were able to be so successful. Um, I did notice when I was there, we of course every day look at our animals multiple times a day to make sure they're okay. They don't look at all their animals every day. So because they can't, there's not enough time, there's not enough staff. So and obviously this is a different country, different cultures, different lab standards. Um, different protocols, so everything was a little bit different for husbandry-wise, a little bit more relaxed than what we are used to here. So here's just some examples of the caging, kind of rolling cages, um, these two these smaller cages that housed individuals that might need, have special needs or were pregnant females. Um, each cage has multiple nest boxes, depending on how many individuals were in that run. They like to you know, one nest box per animal, so that if somebody had to get away from somebody, they could. Um, so they have these rooms and 20 to 40 animals per room, which is quite a dense population. Uh, we don't, I think our largest group is about 15 animals in a room. So, and this is part of their diet. It's much different from ours. So the animals there were only fed three times a week. They were given this watery gruel, which was made from eggs, cheese, gingerbread, and other baby cereal, um, and also some fruit and water. And they were just, you know, it was put in the cage. Whoever got to it first was the winner. Um, but they did quite well. There were some nice plump individuals there. <laughs> So here's an example of the tray that would go into a cage. Um, they, as do we, um, alter our diet seasonally because when the mouse animals slow down, their metabolism slows and they become fat, so we have to cut back their diets. Um, we give them insects as part of their diet for their protein, but this they didn't um, believe in that there. And also, like us, they increase the food. And just for to tell you what kind of what we give them, it looks totally different from this. We give them a powdered chow. Um, that comes from a, a purine of biscuit that we give to our larger di diurnals, but we powder it up with small guys. And we give them a mi mixture of fruit and veggie and a few mealworms <laughs> or uh, crickets. Singers. <laughs> so sanitation was much different. Here we, are, we have strict guidelines. We have to keep things clean. But sometimes we keep things too clean, and that will, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so these guys, and there's also, there, they had no daily cleaning. Um, they gut in the cages every once in a while. But like I said before, there were only two staff members to do this, so there just wasn't time and, and manpower. So for breeding, that was one of my big questions, because I went there. We had a small colony at that time of older animals. So I want to find out what are we doing, what could we be doing. So um, 
once the light cycle changed to their summer light cycle, which is about 14 hours of daylight, they were uh, gotten in hand by our team and the technicians and checked for visible signs of estrus. Um, then if they looked like they were getting ready to cycle, the animals had multi-male, multi-female um, breeding groups. So maybe like three males, three females. So there's that competition, which is part of their breeding behavior. Um, older animals were put in with young animals to show them how to how it's done. <laughs> which sounds a little creepy, but <laughs> so and then a few weeks after the female is pregnant or palpated is pregnant, they are moved into one of those smaller single cages. So um, oh, this guy was cute. Um, so. For them, they have 80 to 100 young per year, which is mind-boggling to me, because um, we had one year where we had 20, and that was like, well, well, no, and you're like, oh, I'm tired. Um, so, but they weigh them similarly to us. Uh, we weigh two or three times a week, the first week um, after they're born, and then we kind of take it down a notch, so we're not disturbing the animals much. Of course, we keep. If the animal looks like it's compromised or doing poorly, we weigh more often, but it's good to leave them alone. Here, if there are animals that were orphaned, they weren't typically hand reared. Um, so use your own imagination as to what happened to those guys. Um, this individual, one of the technicians had, uh, asked the director if she could try hand rearing it, and the director allowed her to. And so he was doing quite well, um, but she would take him home in a little pouch and wear it tied around her bra during the day so and take him out to feed him periodically so and when they become about two months old um, they're taken out the males are taken away from their family group and put into a young group of weanlings and they live their lives wow. yeah so that's he's probably about three to four weeks old um, at that point so Back here. So as I said before, we had zero reproduction between these years. Um, after a lot of work from our curator, getting all the you know, licenses and talking to Fish and Wildlife Service to get them cleared, we brought in nine individuals. Um, we were supposed to have 10, but one animal um, died during the process, and it's extremely difficult they would have had to restart all the paperwork. So we were fine with the nine. Nine's better than nothing. Um, all of the females were proven breeders, and they were at least four years of age. Um, and so part of what I saw in Grunois was we are not housing our animals properly um, to encourage them to breed. So we altered our housing uh, quite drastically. And since that importation of nine, we now have 54 here. There are three at the Bronx, um, and that's those are the only ones in the AZA population. There are some in labs, but we don't consider them part of our population. So, um, similarly to Bruma, we take out the males. Um, we wait a little bit longer until they're about four months old instead of two months old. Um, we put them either with a related male um, or Quite often we have our males housed alone because we do see some aggression, especially this time of year uh, when it's getting, when they're ramping up for breeding season. And we do like to keep our female, uh, related females together. So this is one of our, an example of our mouse and condos. Um, as you, these were built and designed on site. Um, and as you see, ooh, Fancy. Um, we have these fabulous tunnels, and here we have a door. So if we have an animal that's you know needs to be separated for feeding, or if there's a pregnant female that's about to give birth, we can easily separate them out. And likewise, during the breeding season, we have the animals that are supposed to breed kind of near each other, so they can you know talk to each other, smell each other, and once they're ready to go, we can just open up those doors and say, go forth. <laughs> Good luck, <level>, buddy. <laughs> That's just another, sorry, it's a little dark. So one of the very most important things that we're really sticklers about here is lights. We don't like 
the animals being exposed to white light when it's their, their nighttime. Um, and also the photo period, we change that often um, to mimic their seasons. So right now we're starting to get into the longer daylight in the rooms. And uh, so we, and we use red lights. We used to use blue lights. Blue lights are just too jarring for the animal. Of course, we can see well in the blue light, so that makes it great for us, but it's not good for them because it's too much light. So we keep it at a low lux level and it's red light. So when we go into the nocturnal rooms after my talk, you'll see how it can be challenging um, to see the animals in there, but we do have headlamps with red lights so we can get an eyeball on everybody once they're up and moving around. All right, so right now I'm starting to get my mind ready for breeding season. So I need to start thinking about who needs to go with whom. So we have 54 individuals, because we already know the three in the Bronx they are recommended for breeding. But here we have to come up with who's going to go with whom. We have space constraints, we have older animals, we have, you know, who do we breed? So we got help from the Population Management Center in Illinois um, to, to help us put in the numbers and to, they have fabulous programs um, and they can kind of sort out who who's good with whom and who's, so we can keep a genetic, genetically diverse breeding pool. So we take all that information that's on the paper, cut and dry, and then we see who, where we can put these animals. But one of the biggest challenges is coming up with who is compatible with whom. And we have a lot of big personalities and little <laughs> tiny bodies. <laughs> um, so I'm fortunate that right now we don't have many individuals at other institutions. Um, so I kind of know, and I get feedback from other technicians who take care of mouse you know, who's who will not work out. So. So here we have, um, and I'm sorry if you can't really see the writing on the side there. So here we have a mean kinship listing. Um, and as you, these are our top picks for breeding this year. These are the females, those are the males. Um, as this number, this, the lower the number, the more important the animal is to breed. So right now we have at the top of the list, Mrs. Dash. She's an eight-year-old female, which is getting pretty old for a mouse namer. She might be post-reproductive. Um, she did have an infant this year. But, you know, we might think about breeding her. We, we'll probably try to breed her because she is so important. And she, at the top of the other list is asparagus. Asparagus. Oh, asparagus. <laughs> He's the least represented male here. He's one of our original um, French guys. So we want to try and get him breeding because he's he's getting up there in age two, but so you see asparagus he could go with any of these any of these ladies the top three would be primo picks for him, but I have to think about poor asparagus he had an injury a few years ago where he is now compromised he has a little hitch in his giddy up he can't really get away as fast as some of these other guys so. Look at Mrs. Dash, she's an older female. Maybe she'd be great for him. She kind of likes soft touch, I guess. <laughs> um, but we have Pimento, who is a beast of a mouse lamer. Um, she's one of the most feared. And I usually, when I have to hand grab her, I you know, bring somebody else in. I'm like, oh, hey, you want some practice? <laughs> um, we do wear protective gloves, but yeah. still, they, they try their hardest. So I wouldn't want to put poor asparagus with pimento, this giant beastly mouse lemur who will just tear him up or, you know, he he probably wouldn't breed because he'd be so scared of her, he'd probably hide the whole time. So, but anyway, but yes, it's <laughs> sad. Um, so these are our top guys that we're looking at for this year. And we're aiming for probably six births, six infants this year because we do have some space limitations. So this, well, kind of mind-boggling to look at. It looks like a weird game of Tetris. Um, this is called Mate RX, and this shows me that all the greens, the ones, the twos, and threes, are the ones that are most compatible and most genetically diverse. Once you start getting into the fours and the fives and the sixes, those guys are super related. They might be, you know, full siblings. You know, they should not be breeding because they are very related. 
So that is, and all of these numbers up here and on the side are the stud book numbers. And that's, I failed to announce um, or say that I'm the North American Regional Stud Book Keeper for the mouse leaners and the fat tailed dwarf leaners. So I have to know where everybody is in the North American population as far as AZA is concerned. And I'm also the SSP coordinator, which is a species survival plan. So I have to work all this out and get these guys breeding. That's my role. March Madness. I mean, something different to most of the Duke population. But for me, that's when I start having nightmares about breeding mouse lemurs and, and babies and, and stuff. So usually the last week of March, we start grabbing the hand grabbing the females and inspecting their genitals to see if they have genital swellings. Um, in the past, we've done genital smears, but that's a little bit time consuming and we've been really successful with just the hand checking, the visual checks. And um, we do keep a record of when the females cycle every year so we can look back through those records and kind of see that they tend to cycle on or near the same time every year. And for the males, it's not as invasive. Um, we can see they come up to the wire and holy cow, <laughs> <laughs> they grow so large at their testicles. It's amazing. Like I sometimes see the males just sitting there eating off of like using their life. So sorry, these are risque pictures of mouse lemurs. Um, no. So I hope I don't offend anyone in the room. So here's just during the breeding season, because we have some other technicians who um, are really interested in um, this process and also they're taking care of um, mouse lemurs as well. I have these flashcards out on my desk with all of these pictures, so it's fantastic. Um, so just so everybody knows what it looks like if I'm happening to not be there that day. So here we have just typical normal female, nothing's going on. Um, she's nowhere near cycling. Here we have a little bit of flushed skin, um, starting to get a little bit swollen, but still nowhere near time, nowhere near going in with the males because she wouldn't be receptive. Um, here we, as you see, it's getting larger and more angry looking. And here we have a great, great swelling. This is when I probably put the males in with the female because it looks like it's she's about to open. Um, and so their uh, vulvas are sealed mm -hmm. for almost, well, like 363 days of the year. Mm -hmm. So and here we have open receptive female, probably on the tail end of her cycle, um, but still she would probably have bred. And here we have a female with a sperm plug. Sperm plug um, is what it sounds like. Um, the male comes in, breeds, this plug is formed, it's a coagulant, there's no semen in it, but it stops any other males from coming in and breeding her for a period of time. So here we have, here's some of the males. This is a little butternut on the side. He's not doing anything, but here's mighty wormwood. <laughs> he's, he's looking good. So once we see that the females are getting ready, um, we do let the males in. We've already introduced the males to create their breeding duos, usually, like I said, related males, uh, father, sons, uncles, you know, it's, um, anybody in their family, and they create their own, they get together, they work out who's dominant, and then they enter into the fray with the females, and they have like a very elaborate mateship dance. They do a little wiggling and tail wagging, and they have various breeding mm -hmm. calls, most of which we can't hear because they're too high in the sound range for us, um, but there are some that um, are typical breeding, trilling, as I call it. Breeding is brief. The male mounts the female for, you know, one to three or five minutes. Um, she carries them around, and then they go their separate ways. Uh, and genital groom, um, the sperm plug will remain in the female for a few minutes. We do keep an eye on that because if she retains it for too long, it can become a health issue. Um, so they, once the sperm plug is 
falls out, um, they can copulate again. But as I said, usually she's only open for one day a year, so that male better get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> once once the females have cycled, we've seen breeding, or you know she's closing up. We separate them from the males because one of the things with mouse lemurs is aggression is a big part of their breeding behavior. It's a part of their daily living, <laughs> but especially during a breeding, um, we do see a lot of aggression and we accept some of the aggression. You know, a nip or you know a cut here, that's fine. That's what they do. Um, with other lemurs, we might not tolerate that as much, but this is part of, part of what who they are. <laughs> so the males are removed to their cages, we keep them together in case the female turns out not to be pregnant and she will cycle again. Um, if we've seen the breeding behavior uh, at 60, we might wait the full cycling interval, um, which is 40 to 60 days, we might wait 60 days um, to check her or, you know, if we didn't really see anything, we will start doing checks again at 40 days. So at that one month mark, we do pull the females and palpate them and usually give them an ultrasound. So here we are. <laughs> no mouse lemur to insight, but she's there. <laughs> so here we have twins. <laughs> so it's very exciting. So once we find out that she's pregnant, um, we look at the suspected breeding days when she was open. Um, we keep a breeding log for all of our lemurs to note different behaviors because they, you know, sometimes they become much nicer to the males than they normally would be, and that's pretty indicative of breeding behavior. So around the 58 day mark, we move the females into what we call the birth cages. These are, you saw all the, the condos. We have certain cages in each tower system that have smaller mesh so if the infant is left out of the nest box it won't fall through um, and maybe fall into somebody else's cage and be a delightful little snack um, so <laughs> once the, we, the female's getting close to giving birth I usually give her a couple nest boxes to choose from I don't want to give her too many options because if she accidentally left an infant somewhere that would be very detrimental obviously um, they use all sorts of substrate for their nesting material. Different animals do different things. This individual, I think this was Snapdragon, really loved paper cups. <laughs> um, some of them, there's just an infant in the box. They don't build nests. It's just a totally individual thing. So, mouse lemurs love food. So if I notice that they're not coming out for food one day and she's suspected, you know, of giving birth any day, then I know she's probably had her infants and kind of waited out. Yeah. So this is at 72 hours. So that's a lot of volume. Snapdragon, her kids. This is prickly pear. Um, so we've been pretty successful. Our first year. 2010, we had all of our new guys, so this was our big, you know, make it or break it. Did we do all this work for nothing? But we got, had a few that year, so we started out with five, which was great. Nobody died. Yay. 2011, we increased our numbers yet again. All of our females got pregnant. They all had infants. We had no 0% infant mortality rate. 2012 was like, whoa. <laughs> Yes. What do you mean by 10.1 infants? Oh, sorry. So um, in the animal field, uh, that's how we say, so this is the number of males that were born, and this is the number of females that were born. So, sorry, good question. Um, yes, so we had 13 individuals. So 4.1, we had five, we had four males, one female. Uh, seven males and six females the following oh. year. 2012, we had an even Steven. Um, and then from there out, we kind of put the brakes on a little bit because, you know, you have so many animals, where are you going to put them? So we've kind of taken it down a little bit, and then we have kind of maintenance numbers now. So we keep the colony going, but 
not to the extreme like we did in 2012. So you haven't lost any, right? We, uh, we haven't lost any infants. Um, we've ha lost one older individual. So, so this is um, our infant mortality by year. Red equals dead. So there's been no red. So we've done really well. Um, in other facilities, they do have high infant mortality rates, um, like in Europe. Um, and one of the big reasons you have infant mortality is disturbing the dam is a very bad thing to do. So even though it's really tempting to see into that box when you suspect that there's an infant born, we tend to stay away. Um, and you know, we sometimes we wait uh, 24 to 48 hours. Some individuals, if they're a little bit more persnickety, we wait 72 hours um, to check for them to see how many infants are in the box. Uh, we also, if you disturb the female, she comes off the nest. She might eat the infant. Um, we never had that, which is really good. Um, and we also increase to dissuade mom from doing that, we increase their diet by 50% um, so she can feed her kids and also herself and not feed her kids to herself. <laughs> so here we have some <coughs> newborns. This is at 48 hours. Um, they're, they are the smallest primate. They're four to six grams when they're born. Um, they can be lesser or more than that, but that's usually what we look for. Um, so Mrs. Dash, this is twins from 2011, just to give you an idea. They were weighed at 40, 24 hours. She's one of the only females that we've done that with because we knew she had the tolerance for us to do that. And she's a fantastic mom. So they were, that's how they were, how much they weighed kind of at their, around their first day of living. Um, and then we have Wasabi, whose infants were weighed 48 hours, but they were triplets. <laughs> So they, even though their numbers look comparable or larger, they were, you know, full day older. Mm -hmm. So triplets tend to be a little on the lower side on the weight curve. So then we have, you know, these cute little babies <laughs> from the picture before, and then they grow up to these monsters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> monsters. Um, so we have some three-week-old guys that are still in the nest on this side, and here we have some uh, month-old animals. So for the first couple of weeks, they kind of lump around. They don't really, they don't have the muscle tone or they can't get around. They just kind of hang out in the nest box, eating and sleeping, living the dream. <laughs> um, and then around three or four weeks, they start moving around. At four weeks, they're definitely kind of coming out of the nest box, sampling some of mom's diet, much to her chagrin, but still nursing. And so we leave them with their mom for four months, and then the male comes out, and the females still stay together. So here we have the growth curve here. Um, the blue line is the singletons. You see they go up immediately, um, so they do really well. And then they kind of taper off. Twins and triplets are more on the low end. Triplets definitely, because there's a lot more effort put into them, a lot more mouths to feed. But then around 13 weeks, they kind of, all of them kind of plateau, and they're getting close to their adult weight range. So, as you've seen some of the names, <laughs> we have different name schemes at the Lemur Center, and this is just a fun slide. Um, like our blue-eyed black lemurs are named after blue-eyed actors and actresses and um, so forth. And when I first started working with mouse lemurs, they were all herbs and spices, but that kind of got played out because we had so many you know, back in the day, um, and I, you, know, you don't want to reuse a name, that's cheating. So we have all of these new <clears throat> name schemes to come up with, plants, vegetables, and some of them are, go really well with the personalities, Wasabi, she's one of the most feared <laughs> mouse lemurs at the Lemur Center. And then we have Wandering Willie, who's an infant from this year, who loves to just hop around the, the, his nocturnal room when we're catching him. Sometimes he gets away from us and wanders for a few minutes. Um, but and like I said, wasabi and her spicy attitude, these guys are so tiny and you think eh, nobody's afraid of them. They are the most feared lemur at the lemur center. I have a coworker who's our uh, II expert who can handle an II 
They're our, one of our largest nocturnal, uh, they are the, our largest nocturnal lemur. And they're very sweet animals. But if they wanted to, they could probably snap through your fingers. Yeah. She can go in there, she can handle them, no problem, just brave, brave. But you have her look at that face, <laughs> she turns to mush. <laughs> and, uh, you know, very, very scared. And, oh, God! Gets very nervous. <laughs> so, and one of the last things um, I'll talk about or very briefly is we do research with the animals here, and it's all non-invasive research. We're not um, a lab. We just do a lot of um, cognition studies. The mouse lemurs are a great model for Alzheimer's research um, because they, when they get older, they do have uh, display similar um, type of uh, cognition issues um, that um, human Alzheimer's patients uh, display. So we're getting, we're working on that. There's a lot of research in Europe. Um, they have already started uh, researching that, but we're, we're getting into that, and, but it's all non-invasive stuff. We also have locomotion studies uh, to see how different lemurs locomote, and we use the mouse lemurs too. We have uh, behavioral and personality research as well. A lot of, we had some folks, some researchers come in and uh, interview me about, you know, do these mouse lemurs, do they pass on these personalities from generation to generation? I tend to see similar behaviors, you know, Mrs. Dash, she's great, I talk about her a lot, she's my favorite, um, <laughs> but she will, you know, shoot out of her nest tube and, you know, come at you, like, kind of a whack-a-mole type thing, <laughs> um, and I see that with her children as well, they're very feisty, they're all over the place, um, so we do see similarities uh, within the family lines. So, that's kind of wrapping it up. Hmm. Are there any questions? Do they hibernate, and how long? So they, so our guys here don't hibernate, um, and we call it torpor. Right. Um, so they will, they go into, they start slowing down in late October is when I really start to see them kind of gaining the weight, getting lethargic, maybe leaving some of their diet behind until about mid February. They're kind of in that state. But these guys, unlike the fat tailed dwarf lemurs who can stay asleep, asleep um, for days at a time, they won't get up to eat or drink. These guys, they always are up to eat. But they Mad never miss a meal. Yeah, but in Madagascar, or, I, I'm sorry, in Madagascar, would, would, they would hibernate for an extended period of time? About the same, um, because we mimic their okay, photo yeah. period. In the beginning, I, I didn't catch whether the male and females are they dimorphic in size, or can, can you uh, tell them apart? You know, from far away. So um, we do some identification. Um, the mouse lemurs that came from France, they all have microchips, um, which is in French is called a puce, and it, which translates to fleas. So when I was there, and they said yes, they all have fleas. <laughs> There's 500 mouse lemurs here with fleas. So a lot of miscommunication there. Um, but they all had ear notches, mm -hmm. so they could tell them apart. Um, uh, and on their cage carts in France, they had, you know, what the pattern was. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to do that. That's a little too invasive for us. So we um, in put in our own microchip so we can scan them once they're in hand. But if we have animals in, you know, these multi-male, multi-female groups, we have to be able to see who's bringing with whom. So we usually do tail shaves, mm -hmm. uh, and we have different patterns for that. Okay. Um, but the females tend to be slightly larger than the males, but not really, not noticeably. But not at birth. The weights you showed earlier, I thought uh, all the males were slightly heavier. Or did I misread? Um, no, they can. It can vary. Um, they had. Uh, mm -hmm. They were a little bit larger. There was one. Um, of those triplets, that was a male that was only 5.1 grams, and the, uh, the female and the uh, other male were quite a bit larger, and they continued that. Um, but no, at, at birth, they're about the same. At what age are they considered full adults? Four months old. Mm -hmm. They could be, oh. they are sexually mature at four months, wow. but because they're such seasonal breeders, they don't breed. Our youngest uh, female to conceive was eight months old. Mm -hmm. 
Are they born with their eyes open? Yes. I was about to ask that about the eyesight. Are they? Uh, do they have good eyesight when they're born, or is it is it more like other primates? Is it, is it slow to progress? I think it's it's slower to progress, and they don't really have a need for it. They're just kind of there, so um, it does progress the same. If I understood you, you said that the French colony came from ten individuals. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if your colony comes from them, they're all they are related. I mean, it seems. Are you at a point of not being able to breed at some point, or we're not there yet, and we're doing a lot of crossbreeding. So we there are different natural lines, and that's something that was difficult with getting all of the data to find out who can breed with whom because. Our information from uh, Bruma, the um, director, she kept meticulous records of all the matrilines, but patrilines kind of went by the wayside because sometimes you don't know who the daddy is because you have <laughs> you have different ma like three or four different males in a group. Have you done genetic <laughs> testing? Um, we the only genetic testing that we've really done with them is to determine that they are indeed Microsebus murinus. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the funding to do that. Level, okay. yeah. Okay. Are, are there any primates that are smaller than these, or, or is this the smallest one? This is one of the smallest. There's the pygmy mouse lemur, which is 30 to 60 grams of adult weight. So um, that's smaller? Yes, slightly smaller than these guys. These are 60 to 90 grams, so these are a little bit bigger. So that other one would be the smallest yes. primate? So in the wild, would they, around the four month mark, with the boys then leave? Um, it's different there, and even in Brunois, they did it slightly earlier, at about two months. Um, but we, you know, kind of, I don't know, maybe we felt a little, mm, we don't want to throw him out to the wolves quite yet. Um, so I, at some point within that first year, probably before breeding season, they would go their own way. How varied is their diet in the wild? Um, pretty varied. Um, they are great pollinators. Um, they eat a lot of insects, uh, flowers, fruits. Um, so it's it's. They go after the insects a lot too. Yeah. Oh yes, yes, that's. <laughs> they love it. <laughs> so you were recently in Madagascar. Were yes. you working with mouse lemurs while you were there too? Um, no, I was doing more uh, behavioral observations with bamboo lemurs, the uh, um, Hapalemur occidentalis, and. But I was in a forest that was very degraded. It was um, juvenile bamboo, which kind of took back, reclaimed the land after the farmers had left. Um, and there were some mouse lemurs of unknown species there that I got to to view um, every once in a while. But we don't know what species they are. Somebody should go back and find out. to get the lemurs out of Madagascar now? It's extremely difficult, if not impossible. Um, it would be nice because. There is so much habitat loss, but the paperwork, the logistics are just a nightmare. Um, well, are they just trying to be difficult, or are they really sometimes because of all the illegal <clears throat> importation of you know a guy walks in with mouse lemurs in his pants? Like those people that are doing it illegally make it hard for people to do it legally. Well, I mean, with your credentials, it would seem that you didn't have as much trouble. It, right, but it was so hard to get them from France that. I, I think our curator might have a stroke <laughs> thinking about that. But I mean, we, ideally, we'd love. Well, at some point, you don't need. Right, we need more. Right. Balance, you know. Yeah. So you're saying degraded forest. I mean, where do they nest? They can't nest in that juvenile bamboo, right? It's yeah. amazing. I, um, I, these guys um, are kind of nest hole, like tree cavity dwellers. Mm -hmm. But I don't, and I don't know this particular species that I saw. But they would, the best way I can describe it was a like a fuzzy lollipop on top of this piece of bamboo. These, you know, groups of, it was sort of seven or eight males that were grouped together sleeping. And it was just very strange. They felt safe there, kind of out in the open. So not a nest, I mean, they just. Right, they were just there. A lot of lemurs. Yes. <laughs> so, and they're kind of jostling for position every once in a while. But because that bamboo was so dense, Predators, flying predators couldn't come get them. There were no snakes could really go up that bamboo. It was too slippery. So they felt safe out in the open. But the uh, hawks and eagles, things like that, are the predators? Mm -hmm. In that forest, yes. 
when you transferred them from France here, did, <coughs> what, what, how did you do it? I mean, you know, did you sedate them in a sense or? No, they were put, um, our fabulous um, construction guy, and that's, I'm giving him the wrong name right now. Um, hopefully Wes isn't watching. <laughs> um, but Wes, who built all of our caging, he built a special box, which um, I don't know, has anyone seen Jack Russell Terrier races? <laughs> how they load them in so they're in these little compartments and then this, these are jack russells and then they're yeah. released um so they had their little stalls in this big box we shipped that over to france they put in bedding and you know like a few apples and um some juicy stuff for them and then they flew into st louis which has a quarantine a cdc quarantine facility at their zoo they flew in with a bunch of macaques, so I'm sure that was quite frightening for them. <laughs> um, and then Kathy Williams, our vet, went to St. Louis to get them processed, to get them checked into quarantine. They stayed there for 30 days, then they came here for quarantine here for 30 days, and then we were able to put them out in the colony. Where did they put them in the airplane? Or cargo. Yeah, this, yeah. Um, I think this was a, a cargo flight, so it was full of <clears throat> macaques and these tiny mouse lemurs. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Do people who study lemurs come to it from an anthropology background or a wildlife biology background? Um, a little of both. I came from a biology background. Um, I actually didn't know much about lemurs or Hardly anything about lemurs before I came here. It's been really on the job and having fabulous support from uh, my staff so I can learn as much about these guys and really focus on them as my job um, to make sure our colony does well. So, But we do have a lot of anthropology folks come through. Do they, they don't really set mark, do they? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Right. Um, they rely heavily on scent marking and their olfactory cues. And that's one of the reasons they're doing so well in France because sanitation is not as, you know, up to snuff, well, um, <laughs> up to date. <laughs> yes. um, so they don't, you know, their sanitation, they're not as focused on that as we are. And that's something we really had to think about and part of our, you know, monthly sanitation or our daily sanitation we have to we have to kind of back off on that during the breeding season because they do do a lot of marking with their face. They do urine washing with their hands, and they leave you know this wonderful smelling trail across the branches to you know lead their potential mate to them. So yeah, they really that's one of the most important things. Thank you for bringing that up. Do they stay together in um, family groups? I mean, we're talking about fathers with the sons. Is that just what you do, or would they? Do they still keep those bonds uh, so in the wild? In the wild, um, they have noticed that the females kind of stay in one territory and the males kind of interlope around that and they'll come in for breeding season. And every once in a while, um, they might nest with the females, but typically they're just on the periphery of the females. All right. <laughs> Any last questions, guys? That concludes the discussion portion of that, but we do have a surprise for you. We're all going to actually get to go see some mouse lemurs. Um, so if you all want to create a nice orderly line, <laughs> to Alana, and we will get you all going from there.